Hello there. Well, the weather may have turned, so it's a very warm welcome to the official EFL podcast. Cardiff City are in the playoff hunt led by Errol Bullet. I'm delighted to say the Bluebirds boss joins us this week. I'm really happy uh, that I'm here. Great city, great city, great fans, great people, uh, what I met till now. Sky Sports' Gary Weaver has been out and about on his commentating travels. He gives us the EFL inside track. And Richie Wellens takes the ultimate footballing test, the 72 in 72. Welcome. It's the official EFL podcast. Okay, then. The weather outside may be frightful. I've gone a bit early with that song, but I've got someone here to keep us very toasty. Indeed, he's already shaking his head 20 seconds yeah. into the podcast. Gary Weaver, how are you? I, I'm all right, Prutz. Uh, I saw Kieran McKenna say the other night that uh, three hours with you felt like five hours, so we're 30 seconds in, and already I need some lunch. <laughs> how are you, my mate? Are you okay? I'm, I'm good. I felt mortally wounded. It was a pleasure to talk to Kieran. He's, he's, he's doing such a wonderful job yeah. um, at Ipswich Town, and to speak to him after the game, after they were very, very impressive working mm. at home against Millwall, was a pleasure. Right, speaking of the championship, Let's get cracking with that. Some stellar performances, some great results over the past few nights. As we saw, West Brom beating Cardiff. We're going to get the thoughts of Errol Bullock, the Cardiff City boss, in just a bit on the podcast. A big win for Hull City against Rotherham. Borough putting four past Preston. QPR beating Stoke. Watford Norwich, that was your game. We're going to come on to that in just yeah. a second. Uh, Blackburn beating Birmingham 4-2. Leeds United did concede after a minute. They went on to win 3-1 against yeah. Swansea City. A big, big result at the bottom and at the top. Sheffield Wednesday won. Leicester City won. Southampton beating Bristol City. A big win for Huddersfield Town. And as I said, Ipswich beating Millwall, which then does mean that at the very top end of the championship, Leicester City top, but only by a point. Ipswich Town cracking on with their wonderful work. And the top six being made up of Leeds, Southampton, West Brom and Hull City. Right, the game that you were doing so wonderfully, wonderfully well. Mm. Of Watford and Norwich City. Two teams, I think, Gary, that we haven't mentioned that much over the course of the season. Is that because we're looking at two teams, to be brutally honest, underperforming? I think, uh, well, I think a number of things puts with it. Obviously, the teams that came down from the Premier League, uh, they've taken the headlines. Ipswich, as you've mentioned, Watford and Norwich, a bit like West Brom as well, in terms mm. of going on the radar a little bit. Obviously, Albion are doing it better than, uh, than than Watford and Norwich are at the moment. But um, yeah, kind of, I suppose they've been seen as two fading forces while we've got the new rising powers in the championship. But it was a cracking game the other night. Obviously, mm-hmm. Norwich went two up and then Watford came back in uh, 1-3-2. Watford, when they pass the ball around and they, they knock it around, they've got some brilliant, talented players. Yasser Espria, the way he finished that winner off. Mm-hmm. with his clever feet. It's funny because at the time we thought the referee had ruled it out because he's pointing to his hand because Norwich are claiming handball, but he's actually pointing to his wrist saying the, 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 <laughs> the, the shot's over the line. So if you actually listen to it, me and Don look at each other, Don Goodman, we're like, is it not being given? The crowd <laughs> stops celebrating and then they go again. Um, oh, yeah. Almost VAR-like. That's it was. Like, like a Premier League game. Right no, we don't, right want it, we don't want it, we don't want it. Yeah, it was a little bit like that. But... Um, yeah, it, you look at Norwich. I spoke mm. to Ben Napper, the sporting director, who's just come in. Um, I spoke to him on the phone. Stuart Webber, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah, replaced Stuart Webber, who uh, I think Stuart Webber now thinks it's easier to climb Mount Everest than it is to talk to me, which is why he's, uh, <laughs> like he's headed off. <laughs> easier than getting out of the championship. He's got to go and climb Everest. Yeah, uh, but Ben Napper came in. Really good to talk to. Um, he was loans manager at Arsenal, amongst other mm. jobs. Um, and, you know, I, I did say to him, look, a lot of the noise as you were coming in and the, the appointment was accelerated by a couple of weeks was that you might be pulling the plug on David Wagner and his reign. He said, And he said to me, look, I would never, ever do that on the outside. Mm-hmm. I've got to get inside the club, got, got to get context, see how the players react to David Wagner, see what's going on on the inside before I make any kind of decision because that is the biggest decision you make Cute. as a sporting director. Um, but obviously Norwich had back-to-back wins, then they crumbled against Watford. Um, and, and lost three two, and they've got an AGM this week as well. So the joint majority shareholder Mark Atanasio is over from America. He was there the other night, so we wait to see how that goes. But um, but yeah, Norwich with work to do. Watford with uh, Valerian Ishmael, a team, of course, that 
has lost key players. I, I think sometimes we forget mm. that when we're discussing Watford and a team that's just been in the Premier League, well, relatively recently in the Premier League. But have they got a man that's instilling the type of um, culture, the discipline possibly oh. to get that place into shape? You don't mess with Valerian Ismail, do you? <laughs> that's the thing, Prutz, discipline. Again, I spoke to him, you know, very lucky to speak to these people. Um, mm. and, I, and I asked him about what he found when he went in. He, he felt there was a bit of a lazy attitude, you know, on day one of pre-season, which he brought forward, by the way, because he wanted seven weeks with the players. Mm. Five players were late on the first day of pre-season. On the first day of first pre-season? Day, yeah. So um, they all signed up to these rules where they wouldn't be late. So what Valerian Ismail will say, look, I accept wow. traffic situation. It's nothing like that. But just say you're in the building and you're still late for a team meeting two hours later. That's not acceptable. Mm. Um, so since then, I think... I'm right in saying four players have been late since the start of the season. And if you're in the starting 11 and you're late, you're on the bench. If you're on the bench and you're late during the week, you're out the squad. Wow. And all the players have signed up to that. So that's one of the things he's instilled. And I think Ryan Porteous was one of those that was quite vocal in saying, look, there needs to be a bit more discipline here. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so he has changed um, that, uh, Valerian Ismail. And, and also, you know, he wants to be more possession-based, um, I know he's got this reputation, Prutz, because we saw him at Barnsley and West Bromwich Albion have been up and at them direct. But when he was in Austria, his teams were possession-based. The Besiktas, was, So, was he, I mean, was he playing with, literally using the teams that he had? Because with the yes. greatest respect, Barnsley yeah. weren't going to pop the way to the playoff that's why final, why he did it. Yeah. No, that's why he did it. Launch it forward. I mean, you remember we used to see the defence sprinting up to the halfway line when yeah. the ball was launched forward. Yeah. Albion, similar. But he goes and assesses players' strengths. Mm. And he'll play the way that he thinks can get the best out of the team. And Watford's players want to dominate possession. So, um, so yeah, and like I say, it was the same at Besiktas. There's, you know, there was a big meeting after the Sunderland defeat when things weren't going well. He locked the players in for an hour in the dressing room. Every single player had their say. Every single member of staff had their say. It was a discussion. Mm. And they all committed again to what they said after the game. And apart from that Leicester game, they haven't looked back since. Well, we'll keep a keen eye on those two, of course. It always makes me laugh when, having been inside the bubble and come out of it, where um, there's there's a real kind of shock to um, professional people being told to be at work on site. <gasps> and and every other walk of life is scratching the head going, that's just going to work. <laughs> yes, yeah, you're supposed to be there. <laughs> exactly, you can bowl in whenever you want. Um, reminds me of, of, of playing with Nile Ranger at Sheffield Wednesday very briefly. And right. I think... Three or three three times out of the five days of a week would be late. We would rock would rock up. I mean, we 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 started training at half ten, so it's not crack yeah. of dawn stuff. Yeah. And we'd turn up at eleven, and Dave Jones, yes, you're right, Niall. It's it's us that's got it all wrong. It's you <laughs> at, the, at the right time. Really? Yeah, and he just shrugged his shoulder. Uh, he scored a lot of goals, so that's probably why he got away with it. Yeah, um, you couldn't speaking, get away with it. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was there at dawn. <laughs> Play me, gaffer, please. <laughs> Um, speaking of uh, management, well-run football clubs yeah. on the pitch, there may be a slight kind of bump in the road or several bumps in the roads when we look at West Brom. Mm. Undoubtedly, a wonderful recent run of form. Even defeat to Southampton was done in an, in an honourable way yeah. and a, a lot of a bit of a hard luck story for, for the Baggies. Wonderful against Ipswich. Another win last night. A big game at the weekend against Leicester. Sitting very nicely in the playoff places. On the pitch, this looks really rosy, Gary. Without being a cynic, is there anything potentially that might upset this apple cart? Well, I guess, uh, you know, first of all, Carlos Corbran, again, comes up with these game plans that nullify opponents and, and makes full use of what he's got as an Albion um, head coach. 13 hour days, him and his coaching staff uh, in the training ground, you know, just making sure that they analyse absolutely everything. Um, obviously, off the pitch, it's the first time in over two decades they've had no Premier League money at all, whether it's parachute payments or money from being actually in the Premier League. Mm. Um, so, Obviously, that is playing a the part. They are in talks with uh, interested parties over a takeover because they do need new investment. They need a takeover to happen. Um, we know that they've um, they've secured another bridging loan. Um, and I think that the worry is in January, isn't it? Where, mm -hmm. you know, if a club comes calling for an Albion player, Albion won't be held to ransom, by the way. You know, but if the deal is right for mm -hmm. Albion, then, you know, you could see one or two players maybe move on if the deal's right for West Bromwich Albion. So that's the big... Um, cloud on the horizon potentially but Carlos Corberan he's fairly comfortable with what's going on he, he knew that when he took the job that you know potentially this could be an issue but obviously the closer they get to the Premier League the more attractive they become as well so mm -hmm. they'll be hoping that a takeover takes place and then Carlos can, can carry on doing what he's doing which is a, a phenomenal job he's just obsessed with football isn't he Crooks? he's um, 
He, he's wonderfully even... methodical. It's like that when you speak, because I know you speak to him yeah. a lot in and around yeah. the games. He, he, he's there's, there's no shying away from his process. No. He'll explain to exactly <laughs> what he wants, won't he? he, he he's just brilliant. Yeah, you ask him a question and he'll tell you the answer. He's actually, I, I spoke to him before that uh, Ipswich game last week. And he actually said to me, players now, these days, they want to know everything. They want to know why they're playing out from the back. They want to know why this is happening. And, uh, you know, it's explained to them by Carlos Corbran, and he loves that. I mean, I always think the match is getting in the way of training for Carlos Corbran sometimes. <laughs> but uh, uh, he, he's so obsessed with football. During his time off, during the international break from football, he watched football. He was studying <laughs> tapes of Girona and, and Spurs just to see what he could learn and, and sent his coaching staff to, to, uh, away with tapes to go and watch games as well. He, 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 he just loves the game. But the, the, great, the great thing you tell me about Carlos being a former goalkeeper is that playing out yeah. from the back would have absolutely terrified him, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, he's a former keeper. I said, <laughs> I said to him last week, because he was saying about playing out from the back, I said, um, would you have done that when you were a keeper? He said, Gary, put it this way, I'm glad I stopped when I did. <laughs> 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 he didn't fancy himself playing out from the to, back. To be fair, I do see that a lot, thinking about... Um, Particularly my generation of journeyman midfielder going. Oh, I'm not. I'm, I'm not getting it there. <laughs> I'm back to play. You've got that. All, you, all you're going to see for the next 20 minutes is my number and name running away from you. That's it. <laughs> Which is probably why goalkeepers hated me. Um, nope. A bit further down the league, we saw Millwall in action. Joe Edwards, um, yeah. very scathing with what he saw uh, from his side against Ipswich. There's a real job on there, but I think a real sense of who he's worked with, elite level players, mm. what he wants in, from a fundamental side. So I'm intrigued to see how that. Evolves. Big win, as I said, for Huddersfield Town. The bottom three being QPR, Rotherham and Sheffield Wednesday. League one, Bolton Wanderers. Again, uh, apologies, Trotters fan. I mean, I, I, for some reason, I, I, it's, it's remiss of me to say that possibly we've not been talking about it that many times this season. But a team that's top of the league and putting seven past opponents is absolutely worth the yeah. chat, Gary. Yes. Yeah, I'm, obviously, Bolton have been through an absolutely turbulent, terrible, mm. terrible time. Um, in in the last few years, it's been it's been horrible to see, really, but hasn't it? In terms mm-hmm. of what's happened to them. Um, but Ian Evans, we know he likes to play football out from the back and play his way. Um, they stayed on the shoulder of Portsmouth because we've spoken a lot about Portsmouth, rightly so, after what they've been doing and Oxford. Um, but Bolton stayed in the fight and then suddenly hit top spot with that, as you say, seven against Exeter, a draw against Oxford. They're keeping mm-hmm. clean sheets. Um, and Ian Everts, he, he, he tells his players, I want you to make history. I want you to make history. I think they've kept seven clean sheets now in a row, which is a joint club record going back to 1900, which is when you played your first game, wasn't it? But, um, <laughs> but, it's, when I, it's when I bought this top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my hairdo's from there as well. But um, yeah, so he, 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 he encourages his players to break records. He says there's ne- he's never known a togetherness mm. like there is at Bolton in that dressing room right now. And of course, all that plays its part. It's a really, really good top of the table battle developing at League One. I think, um, well, they have Bolton have got Portsmouth coming up in a couple of weeks. I mean, that's that's a game to keep an eye on, of course. And when, when we talked about Portsmouth across the uh, across the season, about um, how well they've done in, in, in league terms being unbeaten, and of course that came to a careering halt uh, against the Blackpool side that we spoke about the other week. Mm. Just doing some very good work in the Des Buckingham, of course, going into Oxford. Um, they currently sit third. Stevenage, just behind them. And knowing Steve Evans like we do, I know he likes us talking about them in, in the most <laughs> glorious of terms. But once again, another cracking season so far. They've played 20 games. They currently sit fourth, three points yeah. behind uh, Bolton and Portsmouth. It's hard to come away from the possibility of his side being absolutely here, up and around it, come the end of the season, isn't it? Yeah, and if they get into the championship, you know, that would be incredible. Mm. For Steve Lynch and, and Steve Evans. He says he's not getting carried away. <laughs> um, he's calmed down a bit, hasn't he, Steve? Apparently, <laughs> over the last few years. Um, but yeah, he look, he's a huge personality and wherever he goes, he, he lifts dressing rooms. He makes, uh, at times, a siege mentality us against mm-hmm. the world. Um, and obviously, they got the draw against Peterborough at the, at the weekend when they were two up, actually, in that game, Steve Lynch. Um, he lives in Peterborough, doesn't he, Steve? So he says, he says when, when yes. I retire, I'm going to go and watch Peterborough. Um but he wouldn't have been happy watching him in the just, second just half. Just behind the dugout. Just three, three <laughs> yeah. rows behind the dugout. The big manager's coat up. Um, <laughs> but no, to do what they're doing, and again, stay in the fight. You know, you look at the big mm. names that are in, in, in League One and Stevenage are there and thereabouts, is, is incredible. But he's not getting carried away. He knows that, obviously, we know there's a long, long way to go. But to be up there right now, standing amongst giants, is incredible. Let's just drop down to 18th. Cambridge uh, currently occupy yeah. that spot. Mark Bonner's moved on. And having spoken to Mark, I've done a bit of work with Mark. Um, again, I, I, I know we're re- relentlessly positive on the EFL podcast, but <laughs> he is 
a man more than worthy of uh, several moments of your time, synonymous with Cambridge United, done pretty much everything there from what yeah. you hear with regards to uh, roles that he's occupied. He's been moved on. They had a very bright start to the season. At one stage, we were discussing Oxford and Cambridge at the very top yeah. um, of League One. Was this, given where they are, Gary, I'm, I hate to use the word, a sense of inevitability, but... Um, a team that hasn't it. been doing, yeah, but I'm going to use it. Yeah, a team <laughs> that hasn't been doing well, and now look for a new manager. Yeah, I think. Look, you mentioned Mark's background with the club there. It's always a shame that it ends this way, isn't it? Um, and I think there was a sense of inevitability, maybe that it was the end of the line because it wasn't just results plus. I think it was performances mm-hmm. as well, and and that's the problem when the two go hand in hand and they're not going well. That's that's when you got a problem. I, I'd, I'd imagine there was a lot of soul searching and heavy hearts at Cambridge in terms of making that decision because of what Mark's done, taking them back to the third tier. You know that incredible FA Cup win against Newcastle. You know he's yeah. given Cambridge fans some amazing times, and it is a shame that it ends this way. Obviously, they survived last day last season. Uh, they don't want to be in that battle again. But again, that's a big ask. You know to to mm-hmm. to, to stay clear of trouble. In League One, we mentioned the big clubs that are in there. But yeah, it's probably a sense of inevitability. I mean, one thing's for sure, they'll never forget Mark Bonner at Cambridge for what he's done. No. And it's it, it's a shame it's ended that way, but I suppose that's football. It, you know, it does tend to end this way, doesn't it? It does indeed. Um, shout out to Reading. 5-1 against yeah. Carlisle. Again, another team where there's so much to the narrative away from the football yeah. pitch that to be able to get out onto the pitch and give the fans something to cheer about, I think is a wonderful thing. Um, something else to cheer about, Barnsley, Barnsley Wickham, mad goals. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? I mean, Max Strike is obviously toying with Sam Cosgrove, isn't it? And Sam has just gone, all right then, <laughs> I'll take up the invitation and, and score the goal. And obviously Wickham felt it should have been a free kick. Sam Cosgrove said it's goal of the month. Um, but of course. It, <laughs> he was desperate for that first goal. But I mean, it, it was a bizarre thing to happen, Prutz, wasn't it? I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that when you've played, but a bizarre thing to happen. Very bizarre. But keeps us all intrigued and interested, doesn't it? <laughs> um, dipping into League Two now, I was inundated with requests from inside the Prutton household. For oh, yeah. Wrexham are in town. They're playing Harrogate Town. Harrogate Town being my <laughs> local club. Um, and Facebook suddenly ablaze. Not that I'm, I'm way too cool, obviously, for Facebook. Um, <laughs> yeah. You can find you can find me on Instagram sure? and Twitter instead. <laughs> um, and MySpace. That, I think you've still got one of those pages. Um, with... Apparently, Ryan Reynolds was coming to Harrogate Town. And so, uh, I, I get Were you mistaken this. for him? Uh, yeah, a really rubbish, like a really low key <laughs> pound Look-a-like. shop version. Um, uh, so, uh, it, it, it's all ablaze with he's in, he's in the vicinity. I mean, when I sat down and tried to explain to my 12 year old, thinking, well, he's at Wrexham a lot because he owns a club. Yeah. I presume he works a lot kind of around London. So, so why he'd come up to Harrogate for a singular game? It's a beautiful part of the world. Don't Happiest get me wrong. place to live in the UK, isn't but, it? But um, I, I did kind of think, um, I did kind of think, I wonder what was going on. But uh, suffice to say, we got there and there was a huge, broad demographic of women of a certain age gutted that he wasn't there and then having to sit to watch football. <laughs> so he, he wasn't there in the end. 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 What a game you had to watch, by the way. Fantastic game, um, and it, it, it's it's a bizarre thing because we get to uh, our job is wonderful. We get to speak yeah. to footballers, see footballers, get up close. But I was still kind of sat there pointing out to my daughter. It's Paul Mull in there. I'm thinking, what, what are you doing? <laughs> He's got a stand name after him. I've, I've worked with him. I've, <laughs> I've covered his game, but because he was there in the flesh. Yeah, <gasps> Ollie, pa- Ollie Palmer was bigger in real life, isn't he? Like, and what about your local boys? Say, what about your local what? boys, Harrogate? I mean, they, exactly. they could have won a couple in the second half. They could. They were. It was backs to the wall for the first half an hour. There's a wonderful. It was Evans, I think, on on the half volley from about 35 yards out yeah. that would have made, made it the third goal for Wrexham. One of those where. He, he couldn't have hit it any sweeter. Hit the yeah. hit the the juncture of the of the crossbar and the post, which I think even because obviously we're very placid and mild mannered. Even the Harrogate fans said, "Ooh." <laughs> <laughs> but Wrexham, I mean, they're travelling great number, great voice. Yeah. They had a lot to work with with Harrogate Town in the second half, given how good they were. So a big big shout out to to the Sulphurites. That's um, us up here in in Harrogate, the Sulphurites. <laughs> and it was nice to have Wrexham in town. Um, uh, and it's incredible, that Simon Weaver. I mean, the longevity yes. that he's got because he, he answered. Um, it, it was an advert, wasn't it, in the non-league paper that he it actually was. saw to become manager of Harrogate. He had a budget of sixteen hundred pounds for his wage, his assistant, <laughs> and his squad. <laughs> when he first took over, unbelievable. And, and and what he's done. I mean, it, it's it's as, obviously there's, there's a very kind of. Um, 
a, a very unique, quaint side to what this this lovely town is that I now call home. But given where they've come from and to be yeah. an established League Two side, the change in the pitch, they had to get rid of their 4G pitch to put yeah. uh, some proper grass. Uh, everything that they've done is wonderful. They do a mean steak pie as well, which is something that you should always sold, keep an eye out for. Sold on me. <laughs> in Harrogate. Um Elsewhere, not too far from us, Bradford City. We covered their game the other week against uh, Notts County where they were awful in the first half. They were better in yeah. the second. Yeah. I was parked up at... They, they train at a school in Bradford. Uh, Bradford City do, ironically. Uh, parked up <laughs> as my son had trotted off to go to training. Then suddenly, he in the pitch black and the fog, walked out. I thought, that looks like Graham Alexander. Uh, and then I thought... I think I'm sat in his car parking space. I better get out and say hello to Graham Alexander and knowing him, Graza, how are you doing? And um, yeah. and obviously that that you know that weird kind of discombobulation of I know you, but why are you here? Why yes. are you in? Why are you in my place of work? Is he you, saying that to you, or are you saying that? Yes, to him? oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I was too busy trying to hug him. Um, but um, and we, so we we looked at that first game. Yeah, we wondered what he was going to do, mm-hmm. and he's done something. <laughs> that's yeah. got them back to winning ways, Gary, hasn't it? Well, I mean, he changed at half-time to a back three, didn't he, at Notts County? Mm. I mean, Notts County were brilliant in that first half as well. Four up, Bradford just couldn't lay a glove on them, really. They had a couple of moments. But anyway, he changed it, and then they, they were aggressive in the second half, scored two, could have actually got something out of that game in the end, mm. Bradford. And uh, the thing with Graham Alexander is he wants to play at least two strikers. He always has wherever he's gone. He felt the big problem at Bradford was a lack of goals. They had to take the burden off Andy Cook. Mm-hmm. Um and Graham, you know, Ryan Sparks, the chief executive, said to me before that Notts County game that they kept an eye on Graham from afar. When he went to MK, where, you know, it was a strange one at MK, manager of the Very month, strange. August, out the door by October. Odd. Um, but yeah, he's always been a bit unlucky, I think, when he's lost jobs. I mean, Gary Neville will say to you, he still regrets getting rid of him at Salford. Yeah. Look what's happened to Scunthorpe since he left. You know, Motherwell, he took them into Europe and they played Sligo the following season, lost, and he lost his job. So he's always been a bit unlucky. And then what happened to MK? But. Uh, it could be a good fit that at Bradford City, and and you know he's uh, he's found a way to unlock their goals. Well, I mean, will he be able to unlock even more goals come January? You think? Well, Jake Young, who's at uh, who's at Swindon. I mean, can't miss. Reason, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, put, look, the reason he was sent out was because then Bradford manager Mark Hughes, he wasn't going to play him. He wasn't mm-hmm. for whatever reason. He wasn't going to play him. He didn't fit in to what Mark Hughes was trying to do. So Bradford thought, well, hang on. Instead of having him, having him here, we're paying his wages, just kicking his heels. We'll send him out on loan. So if you think about it from Bradford's point of view now, he's increased his valuation. If someone yep. comes in in January, he's in form. Had he not been sent out, sent out on loan, none of this would have happened. Um, but yeah, there's a recall in January, so Bradford can recall him in January, and uh, I would not be surprised. If that happens. Yes. Uh, keep a keen eye on that. Stockport at the top. Wrexham second. Barrow. Unbelievable work being done by Pete Wilde there in third. Mansfield Town lost for the first time this season. Fourth, they sit. Crew, Notts County, Gillingham and free scoring Swindon sitting in eighth. Right, that's it for the first part of the official EFL podcast. Gary Weaver's off to go and take a break. Now we're going to hear <laughs> from Richie Wellins, who takes on the monumental 72 in 72. Hi, I'm Richie Wellins and this is... 72 in 72. Plymouth, Exeter, Bristol Rovers, Bristol City, Swindon, Reading, Leighton Orient, Charlton, Watford, Norwich, Ipswich, Birmingham, West Brom, Derby, Stoke, Wigan, Blackpool, Fleetwood, Morecambe, Carlisle, Middlesbrough, Newcastle, oh not Newcastle. Oh, there's another one up there. What are they called? Sunderland. Uh, as you come down that side, Lincoln, Donny, Sheffield Wednesday, Sheffield United. They've gone up to the Prem. Got to be some North West ones. MK Dons, Northampton, Stevenage. I said Watford. Uh, Sutton. Crawley. Southampton. Uh, it's late annoying, I know, I better say that. Salford. Oh, red, red goals, Time. red goals, doesn't it? Well then, a barnstormer there from Richie Wellens, almost threatening the top spot. And who is at the top? It's Matt Smith. He's on 38. Richie scored 33. 
John Coleman third with 26 behind him. Mark Albrighton, Joe Bryan, Liam Rossini, Andrew Moran, Valerian Ishmael, Alfie May, Gary Rowett, Stuart Dallas, Ruben Colwell. And at the bottom is Aaron Ramsey. He's, of course, at Cardiff City, but they're nowhere near the bottom. They're currently ninth in the championship, <laughs> thanks to boss Errol Bullock leading them there. Errol, thank you so much for joining us here on the official EFL podcast. Yeah. Cardiff City in ninth. What have you made of South Wales so far? Uh, well, we, I think I think we we could we could uh, make it a little bit better when we would be a little bit lucky. So we had we had many games uh, where we could uh, win the game, but at the end uh, we we lost we lost points. Uh, so, but uh, from this uh, from these games, uh, only only we can uh, we can learn. So when we are leading the game, so to not. Uh, concede uh, goals uh, to lose points and we lost a few games like that okay I don't want to mention about the referees because you know <laughs> when you speak about the referees it's it's always a, a problem but uh, I had also a few games because of the referees so this is clear so, but, okay, let's not talk about the referees. <laughs> <laughs> well put. Diplomatically put, Errol. I really do appreciate that. I mean, just give us a sense of how big a football club Cardiff City is, because I think you, it, given its stature in Wales, given its, its stature in Welsh football and in the Football League, and of course being in the Premier League, it's a big club, isn't it? Well, be- before when I, when I, when I uh, came here or I was in discussions to sign for the club, uh, of course, I was researching and uh, looking mm-hmm. where, where the city is, the club, and like that. Uh, well, is uh, is the capital of uh, Wales, mm-hmm. and uh, the history is uh, quite quite big enough, I, I think. And play many years uh, in the championship, uh, promoted, uh, I think three three times, three times promoted to the, mm-hmm. to the Premier League. So, uh, with great players in, in the club, like how we said, Aaron Ramsey and a uh, few, few others. So, uh, but my opinion, uh, a club uh, like Cardiff, so belongs belongs really to the to the to the Premier League. So, uh, of course, when we see also the last two years, uh, what issues, what problems the club uh, had. Mm-hmm. So it was not, of course, not uh, not uh, nice for the fans, for the club, and for the players here. Uh, it was not easy, not mm-hmm. easy to come to sign for Cardiff City uh, to say, ah, this team now we're gonna uh, make a difference. Of course, for me, it was also a new challenge. Yeah. Uh, also a risk when you when you say like that, mm-hmm. but uh, I like I like. To, to go risky way a little bit. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Take a chance, I love that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, also when you came in, the economical things, uh, also these problems we had. So we had many, many issues that time. But at the end, uh, I accepted and uh, I'm really happy uh, that I'm here. Great city, great city, great fans, great people. Uh, what I met till now, <laughs> and uh, we're doing till this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> also, also <laughs> I- I- included. <laughs> Errol, what, what, one of the first major uh, victories you had was against Swansea in the South Wales derby, and uh, I know I was very lucky to speak to you on the phone the night before, and I said to you, "What have the fans <laughs> said to you about this game against Swansea?" And you were telling me. That one fan even stopped his car in the street because he saw you and came running towards you and said, "You have to win this game." I mean, the passion of the fans, especially with that derby, is unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, of course. It, it was it was great. We went. We we've, we've been for dinner with my uh, coaching staff. Yeah, and it was I think ten o'clock uh, at night. So we went. Uh, we, uh, we was walking to the cars, and usually somebody jump out of the car. <laughs> so came came to me. It's a cover, cover. So tomorrow we, we we have to win this game. This is everything for us. Ten years we couldn't win and like this. I say uh, one thing I can tell you. I know about derbies uh, very well because I played many and I was also leading as a manager some uh, big derbies. Mm. 
so don't worry, I said, be relaxed. You can, you will support us uh, on the tribune in the stadium. So we will make our job on the field. So that day was everything perfect. Yeah. What What have you made of the championship so far? The teams that you've seen, Errol, and, and, and more broadly, so culture over here, Welsh culture, English culture, the fans, the whole kind of match day environment. Well, yeah, of course, the, the league is much much different than uh, than uh, what I had now uh, mm. in, in Turkey, Turkish Super League. So. You have many teams, many qualitative good teams. When you see the last uh, three years, which teams are relegated mm -hmm. and still they have quality uh, in, in their team and also teams they invest really well. Uh, what we couldn't because we, we, we had the punishment, mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 had, we could take only free uh, transfers. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we try to uh, get the best uh, players, but uh, it's not easy. It was not easy, but I think till now, what we show and uh, what we made, uh, we, we did a good job with, with my players. Errol, you seem to have re-energized the club, you know, the players, the fans, the owner as well, Vincent Tan, seems re-energized. I mean... We know Vincent had his own unique way of wanting to see the game and how football is played. But what's your, what's your relationship been like with, with Vincent and how strong a personality do you have to have to manage Cardiff City? Well, uh, I, I spoke with Vincent a uh, few, few times. So his character, is, he wants to win also. So he's, he's a big businessman. Of course, he wants to win. He, he, was, he was winning always with, with, uh, with deeds, with business. And so he see this also as business. Uh, you, uh, this is normal. So that he, he wants a lot of victories. Uh, but I, I'm not different. So uh, I, I hate to lose. I hate to lose. I, I want I want to win games. So at least when when you lose, you have to fight till the end uh, to not lose. Even you lose, you have with fight. You have to lose that game. That you have to show you want and you try everything. And uh, so till now looks everything uh, well, but of course Winston is also uh, he he have a different opinion about football a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> he does. So uh, uh, how I said uh, we spoke a few times. It was a good uh, conversation, and uh, of course I try also to explain him how football really uh, goes. Okay. The managers before me, they did the same. I, I'm, I'm sure. So, <laughs> but when when he explained it in a realistic way, so mm. I think uh, uh, he, he should understand this. So football is not only that you have uh, seventy percent ball possession, you are shooting uh, thirty times on the goal, but you lose the you lose the game for one goal. And this is the, yeah. this is football. Yeah. So you understand. So it's not always you keep the ball. Or you are creating a lot of shots. You have to win the game. Sometimes it's Absolutely. not like that. It's um, if you're listening to this podcast, the great thing is uh, myself and Gary have, have sat with with Errol, and he was wonderfully patient setting up his uh, his phone his end to get us on to be able to chat. And I've just got a semblance here. I don't know whether you have, Gary, but a manager is very busy. Errol, I mean, you're getting messages, yeah. you're getting emails, you're getting everything. <laughs> <laughs> with the, and, I mean, we we speak to so many managers on here, and you talk about managing in Turkey and now managing over here. It, it, it's, it's an understatement to say it's a very, very, very busy job because people constantly come for, to you for answers, don't they? Whether it's players, whether it's owners, whether it's the media, whether it's people asking you to come on podcasts. Your time is at a premium and it is so precious, isn't it? Yeah, uh, of course. But uh, so in, in the Turkish Super League, uh, I didn't have it maybe uh, so much so much I, I had a little bit more, more time because mm -hmm. we didn't have games every three days so game by game yeah so, so even sometimes uh, I cannot train for myself in the gym I don't have time for that so <laughs> you that mean? <laughs> this, this is a, this is it's a good excuse part. though it's a good excuse so I, to I, not I, go I, in the gym I, I have to take care about, about my shape so 
<laughs> Me too. <laughs> but it, it, it's such a good point, though, Errol, isn't it? I mean, and, and you strike me as a manager that, I mean, you set that example to your players. I've always thought that when it's come to management. If, if you're being told, if someone's screaming at you on the side of the pitch who looks like they couldn't do it themselves, part of you as a player is kind of looking over thinking, hang on. But if you're in the kind of shape that you're in, you're setting the example. You want your players to be dynamic, energetic, and the manager's got to set that culture. Is that something that you take pride in, in managing your teams and clubs? Yeah, but I, I think uh, even, okay, well, I, I stopped to play uh, when I was 37, so 20 years professional I played. So after I had uh, five years as assistant and then I became a manager, but I'm always, always in the opinion uh, the manager on the line uh, should show a little bit character, mm -hmm. and uh, not only this, also how 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 he looks on on, on, on on the line. So uh, so <laughs> that's why we have to take care also about our body. So sometimes in training sessions, I'm involved. Mostly, mostly five against two. I'm, I'm playing. <laughs> you're, you're, you're part of the, you're part of the five, definitely. <laughs> yeah, to, 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 to not make many many distance. Uh, so, <laughs> so no, I, I, I like to be sometimes uh, sometimes in also when we have uh, running sessions, so mm -hmm. that I have some uh, some runs. So to to show to show the player. So or even with forty eight. I want, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm in. So the the players have to be always, always no like, excuse. Their, no like, excuse, like, like their job. Uh, of course, if I could uh, play, I would continue to play. But uh, okay, one day we have to stop, and I stop, and also the players that they, they see, uh, the coach still with 48, so he's uh, <laughs> he's willing to 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 play. But uh, one day it will be finished. So they have to take these years very carefully mm -hmm. and uh, to give everything they have only maybe 15 years to, to play in these 15 years they have to make everything uh, uh, well and play on the highest level and push for for the maximum because after afterwards you cannot sit and say why I didn't make this game like this why I didn't play like this so uh, no, no right. excuses anymore then it's over <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to the gym this afternoon, Errol. You forced me to go to the gym for the first time in years. Errol, I was going to ask you about Aaron Ramsey. I, I, I know, obviously, he's been injured, but, you know, you've managed Fenerbahce, you've managed big players. Aaron Ramsey, at back at Cardiff City, as you know, is a huge coup for Cardiff City. What's yeah. his influence like in terms of off the pitch as well and his, you know, his presence of being there and around the club? Uh, it's, it's, it's very important. First of all, I, I want to speak about his character, uh, great, great character. So he don't he don't have the ego to say ah I play in Arsenal, I play in Juventus, and uh, show to his teammates oh, look I'm, he don't have this uh, the perfect perfect character. So this this is the first for me, for me, for my players I I want this character is before before the quality of uh, of the football player. So quality you can have, you can have. But when the character is not correct, so this can destroy the team. So, first of all, I'm, I'm watching the character of the player, of course, then the quality. But not first the quality, and after I meet the player, so the character is nothing. So, for, for what I need, the, that kind of player, uh, yeah. this one player can destroy uh, the team. So, this we don't need. And God thinks I have good characters in the team. And... Uh, of course, Ramsey, uh, when, when he's on, on, on the field against the uh, opponents, the opponents, they are respecting him also mm -hmm. uh, too much. So it's, it's different to play against a big star like uh, like Ramsey. So this makes also the change of uh, the, the, the game sometimes with the, with the opponent yeah. right? against him. Gary, I know you spent a lot of time down in South Wales in Cardiff. I, mean, I have. Have, have you got any recommendations to Errol for play, <laughs> places to go? Uh, I've got a lot of recommendations. I think Errol was in the Queen's Vaults pub, I think, uh, was when you met a few Cardiff City fans, Errol. But, I mean, one thing I'd say quickly about Cardiff City is, and it surprises managers, the new managers, the level of scrutiny 
in the media on the capital city club from Wales, it's like a Manchester United and it can surprise managers sometimes. But Errol's obviously managed Fenerbahce, so he's used to all that <laughs> media <laughs> scrutiny and that pressure. Yeah. Of course, when you're, when you when uh, you lead a club like Fenerbahce, so you can imagine how, how the media is, is uh, is the one of the biggest uh, yeah. clubs in, in, in Turkey, so with uh, a lot of victories, uh, winning of championships. So I was as a player there. I won the title and I, I've been as a coach there. So uh, so the pressure with, with big, those big clubs are much, much different. Yeah. Uh, you get from everywhere some some shots so you have to be <laughs> you, you have to be good uh, uh, organized for that uh, okay but this this is football so if you, if you if you don't want uh, to to lead a big club so you should go then you have to stay in a, in a smaller club but I don't have any problem with that well, I mean, that, that that real sense of kind of composure does really come across, Errol. You, you mentioned um, managing in Turkey. You, man, you mentioned, obviously, uh, that, that vast and, and, and very, very kind of highly respected playing career. And you talked about the championship. And, and we, we love it in English football because, obviously, not playing it anymore, that we can watch two games a week. And there's always another game every two days, every three days. You get into Christmas, there's one every other day, it feels like. Yeah. Um, and has, has that been the even though we've had what three or four international breaks has that been the, the kind of biggest difference that you say because you talk about time for yourself to train but time to get on the pitch with the players to get your ideas across because there's a, the games come thick and fast you played in the week you've got Southampton at the weekend there's travel involved in that it's relentless isn't it yeah the, the, the good thing is or maybe the bad thing I, I don't know because you have a game you win or, or you lose you don't have time to analyze uh, your, your game <laughs> so the previous game so uh, to show some uh, to show to the players so this we can could we could make a better this we could make like that because it's a regeneration uh, adaptation and then the three days later is, is the game so like uh, now starting this uh, one month will be really busy, but uh, okay, we can we try to give uh, how much as possible to the, to the players, even when when it's a short time with individual videos and like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, of course, I don't like uh, how I said to lose games. When I lose game, I'm thinking too much, but I have to learn to not think, so to <laughs> think about the next game, not yeah, what what happened uh, with the last game. So mm -hmm. this have to change, uh, and I have to adapt on this. Mm -hmm. So three three points off the top six is that where Cardiff's aims are this season? Is that where your aims are as a manager in the championship? The playoffs come the end of the year. Uh, I think this uh, what is going right now with the, in the table. Uh, this up and down. This will continue till end of the season, like that. My mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah. Because uh, many clubs, good clubs, are involved in that. Who wants to be in the playoffs? And qualitative, uh, good, uh, good teams. But we we want to be uh, close to that uh, to the playoffs, not far away. Close mm -hmm. that. I hope in January we can we can we can make something on the transfer market mm -hmm. that we can push more for the playoffs. It's one of those a striker, Errol. Kiefer Moore's being mentioned. We won't mention Kiefer Moore, but Kiefer Moore's being mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> You're hopeful. Uh, well, for Kiefer Moore, we was, we was trying already in, in, in uh, summer, but uh, uh, it was not, not, not possible uh, yeah. because they, they, they tried to uh, sell him or they wanted to sell him uh, his club and because of our uh, penalty. Mm -hmm. We couldn't make anything, and uh, okay, we have to see also the financial aspect on the other side from the from uh, Cardiff City. So, uh, I hope, I hope also the board members uh, they see uh, how hard we was really doing till now, and uh, they are they are satisfied, my opinion, and uh, that's why I hope in January they're gonna invest a little bit more that I can get three, four more players qualitative that uh, we can we can push yeah. 
push for more. I'll tell you what, Errol, this has been an absolute pleasure. We really do appreciate you taking the time, um, getting on board with our, our technical um, requests <laughs> and, and getting your app downloaded. But it's it's fascinating to hear and, uh, and I'm always always very intrigued to see this this football that we love in this country, how it is appreciated, how it's kind of dealt with from someone who's been so very successful somewhere else. And you, you seem like you're really enjoying it. It's, it's just a lovely, lovely thing to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying, of course, uh, when I see also that, that all the uh, stadium when we play at home, the fans are behind the team, behind us. So mm-hmm. this, is, this is very important. So when, when, when players feel supporters are behind us and uh, so the players will push for more so because uh, previous uh, two years uh, of course with the performance of, of the players was I think not uh, good enough the fans was a little bit against them so the atmosphere also was not uh, clean and nobody was happy so then uh, the performance performance of the players is dropping down, but right now, I think uh, fans, uh, football players, the the manager, I think we are right now like this, and uh, I hope this will go till end of the season, and I hope uh, that we can get this uh, target where we are focusing. Wonderful, Brilliant. Zane. I'm sure all the Cardiff City fans will be thrilled to hear their boss talk in that type of manner. Errol, thank you so much for joining us on the official EFL podcast. Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Thank you, Errol. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. So, it's a huge thank you to the charismatic Errol Bullet, the ever-charming Gary Weaver, and the ultra-competitive Richie Wellings. As always, if you've enjoyed, then please do give us a five-star rating, press the follow button, and share on your socials. If you'd like to get in touch, our email address is podcast at EFL.com. That's podcast at EFL.com. My name's David Brutton, and I'll see you same time next week for another episode of the official EFL podcast. <laughs>